Yes. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One King, one Husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. The woman who was waiting in Sergeant Preston's office was beautiful, with very dark hair and eyes, her teeth brilliantly white against the deep red of her lips. She wore a sable coat and hat. There was a large ruby ring on the third finger of her left hand. How do you do? You are Sergeant Preston? Yes. I've been told that you're in charge here. That's right. Inspector Conrad has gone down to White Pass. I don't imagine that he's missed it all. If you don't mind my saying so, your appearance inspires confidence, Sergeant. It's the uniform. It's extremely handsome. Thank you. Uh, You have some business? Yes, I should introduce myself. I'm Alexandra Carr. A pleasure. My brother Nicky and I have come up here to try and recover some stolen property. Yes? An emerald, Sergeant. An extremely large stone, about 25 carats. Well, it is large. Must be famous. No, it isn't perfect. But it's worth about $50,000. Where was it stolen? In New York. What makes you think it's in Dawson? It isn't yet, but it will be. That's very interesting. Suppose you give me all the story, Miss Carr. Well, after the emerald was stolen, we reported it to the police, of course. But they couldn't seem to do anything about it at all. Checking pawn shops, for instance. How could anyone possibly pawn an emerald of that size? Nicky and I decided to find it ourselves. An ambitious undertaking. We used our brains and an old axiom. Set a thief to catch a thief. It's been known to work. We did. I suppose it was a little dangerous, but we managed to contact some important people in the underworld. And we finally found a man who had the information we wanted. It cost us $5,000. Did you pass the information on to the police? No. Why not? Because the man who stole the emerald had already left the country. It was in San Francisco that we found out who he was. And we were told that he'd taken a ship for the Yukon. There was no need of your coming up here. You could have had the police in San Francisco contact us, and we'd have done our best to arrest the man. Yes, we thought of that. I think we were afraid to try it. Why? This this thief had friends as well as enemies in San Francisco. We were afraid they might try to do something to us. And communications are so bad between here and the States. Nicky and I had nothing else to do. Why shouldn't we come up here ourselves? It's a rough country. Well, it's been fun, and it wasn't too hard a trip. We took the Northern Star to St. Michael. And the Yukon Bell from there. Yes. We just arrived. Just in time. There's ice in the river this morning. Here are some papers you ought to look at, Sergeant. They prove that Nicky and I own the emerald. And uh, here is a description of the man who stole it. I hope you can read my writing. Of course. Louis Milano. He uses other names. 5'8", 150 pounds, black hair, brown eyes, scar on the left cheek. That seems to be complete enough. Why are you so sure he's coming to Dawson? Because we were told he would. We thought he'd be here when we arrived. He must have come in by way of Skagway and the White Pass. That takes longer than it does by steamer. Is there any reason why he shouldn't stop at White Horse, for instance? He may stop. But he's come up here to sell the emerald to one of your Bonanza millionaires. Perhaps to that man who's built the huge house north of Dawson. What's his name? Gates? Gates is in New York. Cragman is manager. He's the only one who's living there now. Cragman? Yes. You know him? No, no, of course not. I don't know anyone up here. It's an odd name, that's all. Oh, there's one other thing, Sergeant. Yes? Milano has had the emerald completely covered with gold. What? The outside surface isn't smooth. It looks like a nugget. There are a lot of nuggets in the Yukon. But there's an emerald inside this one. Sergeant, I'm absolutely sure that you're going to find it for us. Nicky and I shall be staying at the palace if you want us for anything. During the next few days, the sergeant made sure there was no one who answered Louis Milano's description in Dawson. And he sent the description by courier to every other northwest mounted post in the territory. Also, and this was without Alexandra Carr's knowledge, he asked the inspector at White Pass 
to obtain all the details of the car robbery from the States. But on the evening of the third day, there was a sudden development. Nicky Carr burst into the sergeant's office. Easy, boy. Sergeant, I'm Alex Carr's brother, Nick. How do you do? I've seen him. I've seen Louis Milano. He was standing in front of one of the warehouses down on the waterfront talking to another man. I came straight here. You're sure it's Milano? Absolutely. The right height, the right weight, the scar on his left cheek. I'll show you, Sergeant. Will you come with me? Of course. Just as soon as I get into my park. I'll... Yes, King. You can come along. The Sergeant and Nicky Carr started for the waterfront. Dawson had had its first snowstorm, but the snow had melted and the streets were muddy. The sky was overcast with the promise of another storm. A raw wind blew up from the river. It was a dark and dismal night. There was no light to relieve the gloom along the waterfront, but Nicky led the sergeant straight toward one of the larger warehouses. I wonder what Milano's doing down here. There's no telling with someone like him. Do you have a gun, Sergeant? Of course. What were you doing down here, Nicky? It was nothing but luck, Sergeant. I wanted to see if the river was solidly frozen yet. It's dark. How'd you manage to make out Milano's features so clearly? There was a lantern hanging over the door of the warehouse. There was, Sergeant, but there isn't now. That's the place just ahead of us. It belongs to Roger Gates. Maybe Milano was trying to sell the emerald. Not to Gates. He's in New York. What'd the man with Milano look like? Sandy hair, a beard, heavy set. Doesn't sound like Craigman or anyone else connected with the Gates organization. No one in front of the warehouse now. No, Sergeant, but the door's open. It wasn't before. You better stay here. You can now go on along. All right. Someone inside there, King? Uh, yes, I can see. Someone just struck a match. Cautiously, the Sergeant and King approached the open door of the warehouse. Just inside, they could see a man kneeling, holding a lighted match. Stretched out on the floor was another man. Put up your hands. What? You heard me. Who are you? Sergeant Preston, Royal Northwest Mounted Police. Well, that's a relief. I thought I was going to get it. What are you doing here? Well, I heard the shot and somebody yelled. I was on Front Street, passing the other end of the warehouse. I came running. This door was open. I lit a match. I could see somebody in here lying on the floor. I came in to take a look. Well, what about the man on the floor? He's dead, Sergeant. Shot straight through the heart. Light another match. Sure. There's a lantern hanging on the wall there. Light that. Yeah, all right. Nicky, come here. All right, Sergeant. You ever seen this man before? Me? Why, I... I don't know. What kind of an answer is that? Well, I may have seen him around town. He's not a friend of mine, if that's what you mean. What is it, Sergeant? Look. the man you saw with him? No. This man's much younger. Did he shoot him? No, I didn't have anything to do with it. What's your name? Joel Turner. What about... You know, Sergeant, have you searched the body? Not yet. I will right now. Papers. Lawrence Miller. That's another one of the names that Milano used. And money. Nothing else on him. No nugget? No. Can you find out where he was staying, where he left his things? I'll do that, Nicky, in the course of my investigation. But my first interest is trying to find out who killed this man. Murder happens to take preference over robbery. Well, I didn't mean it. Of course, I know. Can I go now? Not till after your story's checked. Did you see anyone when you came around the corner of the warehouse? Yes, I, I did. Not clearly, though. A man? Yeah. Can you describe him? I was heavy set. I think he had light hair. May have been gray. Sandy. That's the same man I saw. Was he running? No, but he was walking very fast. In that direction. North. Is it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Nicky, would you know him if you saw him again? Of course I would. He shot Milano, Sergeant. I'm sure of it. He shot Milano and he stole the nugget. Could have been the motive if Milano had the nugget. First, we'll have to get him down to headquarters. Then I want a full description of the other man, Nicky. We'll check every building in Dawson and every trail leading out of town before the night's over. Well, I have to... You're coming to headquarters with us, Turner. Okay. Let's find something in here to make a stretcher. The dead Louis Milano was taken to headquarters. There, the sergeant grilled Joel Turner. He was able to account for all of his movements that evening, and finally, satisfied that he had no part in the murder, the sergeant released him, but warned him that he would be called as a witness. The search for the man with the sandy hair began, and every available member of the force was assigned to it. A few suspects, answering Nicky's general description, were brought in, but they were able to prove they were nowhere near the scene of the crime and were allowed to go free. Then a prospector showed up at headquarters. May I see the dead man, Sergeant? Do you think you know him? 
from the talk that's going around, maybe I do. He's in here. Under the blanket? Yes. Well? That's him. He said his name was Miller. Came up from the south and into Shantytown late this afternoon. I met him in the Blue Moon Cafe over there. Is that all? You only met him? He had no place to stay, so I told him he could share my cabin. Brought all his stuff there, and we had some supper, and then he came over here. That's the last I saw him. Until now. I want to look through his belongings. Sure. I'll have to be brought back here. It's snowing, isn't it? All right. I'll harness up my team and drive you home. Come on, King. It was an hour later when the sergeant had nearly finished with his inspection of Milano's belongings that someone knocked at the door of the prospector's cabin. Probably one of my pals, Sergeant. I'll tell him you're busy and can't be disturbed. No, don't do that. I'll be through in a minute. I want to see Sergeant Preston. Oh, there he is. Hennigy. What's happened? Your head's bandaged. You've been wounded. Yes. My sister shot me. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Now to continue our story. Mickey Carr appeared at the cabin where the sergeant was checking through Louis Milano's baggage. His head was bandaged, and he made the startling announcement that his sister had shot him. Your sister? Oh, it's nothing, and it was an accident. But she's done something foolish and dangerous. What's this all about? You haven't found the nugget here. No? Or any clue? I'll discuss that after you've told me about your sister. Well, we've known something all along that we haven't told you, Sergeant. What's that? Milano came up here to sell the emerald to Roger Gates. To Cragman, you mean? To Cragman, acting as Gates' agent. I just learned that from this letter I found. Oh. What does it have to do with your sister? Well, she and I were talking about the murder. We figured that the man with the sandy hair must have been someone that Cragman sent into Dawson to meet Louie. Instead of paying him, he shot him and took the nugget. Well, that means Cragman has it now. Alex said that we didn't need the police, that we could go up to Gates' place where Cragman is staying and get it back by threatening to expose him. I refused. She said she'd go alone. I tried to stop her. She had a gun in her hand, and accidentally it went off. The bullet only grazed me, but I was stunned for a minute. When I came to, she was gone. Did you try to follow her? Yes. I couldn't find her, but I'm sure she's hired a dog team and is heading north along the Yukon. If Cragman has gunmen working for him, she'll be killed. I'll go after her. Can I come with you? Yes, you're the only one who actually saw the man who was with Milano. He's up there. I'll need you to identify him. My team's outside. We'll leave at once. Let's go, King. The ice on the Yukon wasn't strong enough to support a dog team. But the newly fallen snow made fast travel possible. And in less than two hours, the sergeant and Nicky sighted the Gates mansion. It was a big house. And the fact that it was built of logs didn't distract from its impressiveness. Inside, it was as well furnished as any of the great houses along Fifth Avenue. And during the summer, it was a scene of Roger Gates' lavish parties. But on this stormy winter night, it seemed desolate, deserted. Only one faint light glimmered from its shadowy mass as the sergeant drove up the hill. King! He's here, sergeant. There's a dog team out in front. Yes, that's the team she rented from Joe. I know that black lead dog. I hope we're not too late. We'll soon find out. Okay, hurry, huskies. One King, with me, boy. Nobody in this front room where the lamp's lit. Someone coming. I can hear footsteps. Yes? Why, it's Sergeant Preston. Good evening. Is this Cragman? I'm Ben, the caretaker. You wish to see Mr. Cragman, Sergeant? We want to see my sister. Your sister? I I know of no young lady who's here. We'll talk with Cragman, Barrett. Yes, sir. This way, sir. <laughs> oh, Sergeant, please, not King. Huh? His paws are muddy in the rugs. I, well, I'm responsible for them, you know. It's all right. You'll have to stay out here, King. Vanguard, boy. Well, if you'll wait in the drawing room, Sergeant, I'll call Mr. Cragman. Thank you, Barrett. I imagine he's gone to bed. I imagine he hasn't. Will you look at this room? 
Imagine finding something like this up in the Yukon. Roger Gates is just about the richest man in the territory. To think of his having a crook like Cragman for his agent. We have no proof that Cragman is a crook. He was in touch with Milano. He agreed to buy stolen goods. The letter you have is proof of that. He agreed to buy an emerald. I'm not sure he knew it was stolen. I am. He's too well known in the San Francisco underworld not to be a crook. That's impressive. Hello, Cragman. So, uh... Barrett didn't have to awaken you. Oh, I've been working in my office, the next room. But I confess that I was about to go to bed. What brings you here so late? On your way to Dawson? We've just come from there. We're looking for a young lady named Alexandra Carr. Really? And you expected to find her here? We know she's here. Her dog team's out in front. I assure you I know nothing about her. Well, listen, that's Alex. Sergeant, she's in the next room. You're covered, Craigman. Arch ahead of us and open that door. Well, if you insist, Sergeant. Oh, thank heaven. Alex, are you all right? No, I am. There was a man holding a gun on me, but I could hear your voices, and I had to let you know I was here. Who was the man? Barrett, the caretaker. He's the one who killed Milano. Where is he? He ran out in the hall after I screamed. Nick, you have a gun? Yes. Mine's there on the desk. Keep Craigman covered until I got Barrett. The sergeant opened the door and ran into the hall. It was empty. The sergeant was undecided which way to turn until he heard King barking out in front. He ran down the hall to the front door and threw it open. Get out of my way, Barrett had reached the front of the steps, but King was refusing to let him go any farther. He darted from side to side, forward and back, menace in every move. Barrett raised his gun. Drop it, Barrett. Drop that gun or I'll shoot. Drop that gun. Good work, King. We'll be with you in just a few minutes, boy. I'll move, Barrett. Yes, sir. Back to Cragman's office. It wasn't my fault. He made me. You're talking about Milano's murder, aren't you? I didn't want to. Oh, you caught him, Sergeant. Yes, and he's practically confessed to killing Milano. I don't understand. His hair isn't sandy, it's gray. I think you saw him with the light of a red lantern. That's right, I did. And wearing a parka, he might have looked heavy. He did it, I'm sure. Get over there with Cragman, Barrett. All right. There, you fool, you cowardly fool. <laughs> oh, this relieve it. It's too much. I'm the one who's a fool to think I could threaten those two. To think I could force them into giving me the emerald. My Cragman simply reached out and took my gun away. But I have it back now, Mr. Cragman. Do you have any idea where the emerald is? Yes, in the wall safe in the next room. All right, Cragman. <laughs> Does something amuse you? <laughs> it's the funniest thing ever run into. Eh? <laughs> you can't be blamed for being fooled, Sergeant. But me, who knows Frisco like a book... She looks so different, though. It's the best act she's ever put on. What are you talking about? She's no more Alexander Carr than I am. The sergeant has proof of my identity. Yes, I'll bet. I'll bet your current gentleman friend here is a forger. You lie. Sergeant. That woman is Gold Coast Annie, the slickest competence woman in California. Nick. As the woman cried out, Nick, who was standing Get behind the way, sergeant, Nick, brought the front of his gun down hard on the Maori's head, and he dropped to the floor. Don't move, either of you two. How about a little deal, Annie? I'm making the deal. Nick, get some rope and tie both Barrett and the sergeant up. Cragman's going to need his hands free to open that safe. At the very moment when Nick's gun came down on the sergeant's head, King leaped to his feet. Perhaps he heard his master's voice. He hurled himself at the front door of the house. He realized at once there was no way he could force it open, and he ran down from the porch and started to circle the house. There were no windows open at the side, and he continued on to the back and ran up the steps of the back porch. One of the windows off it was slightly open. King was able to stick his head inside. He tensed the muscles of his neck and pushed upward. The window opened a few more inches. That was enough. King wiggled through. The room he found himself in was a large pantry. There was a man lying on the floor, bound and gagged. King ran past him to the door. It was closed. He pushed against it with his forepaws. The catch held. He knew that he must turn the knob to open it. And he tried desperately. But it was impossible for him to get a grip on the round, shiny metal. One needed hands. The wonderful hands that men possessed to turn it. King had recognized the man on the floor. He wasn't a friend, exactly. But then he wasn't an enemy, either. When the sergeant had said goodbye to him that evening, there was nothing in the tone of his master's voice to indicate that. Perhaps if the man's hands were free, he would open the door. 
King ran to him and started to chew the ropes that bound him. Good boy, King. Hurry. A few minutes later, the ropes around the man's wrists parted. He reached up to his mouth and tore off the gag. You're, you're King. If, if you're here, that means the sergeant's here, too. I'm luckier than I have a right to be. Just wait till I get these ropes off my feet. Joel Turner worked fast. The last knot was untied, and he stood up. Not too fast, King. Keep quiet. The pantry opened on the kitchen. King ran across the room to the door that led to the center hall. Wait, wait a minute, King. I'm going to get a knife. Better than no weapon at all. Yeah, here, this will do. You seem mighty anxious. I hope you know where the sergeant is. <laughs> all right, all right, I'll open the door. Leave me to the sergeant. Turner opened the door, and King ran down the hall to the door of Cragman's office. He scratched at it. Are you sure he's in here? I can hear voices in the front room. All right, I'll take your word for it. King ran to his master. The sergeant had recovered consciousness, but he was lying on the floor, bound hand and foot. Barrett lay beside him, also bound. Hello, King. Turner. That's right. Do you work for Craigman, too? No, no, I can explain everything. Well, don't bother. Just keep your voice down and cut these ropes. All right. How did you get free? You shut up, Barrett, or I'll use this knife on you. No. I was a fool, Sergeant. Barrett's the man who killed Milano. I know that now. I recognized him as he was running away. I can tell you because I wanted to capture him myself. Here you are. Nice. There's a big reward for the return of the emerald. I'm a private detective from the States. So that's it. Just wait a second while I got some circulation back in his hands. I came here and managed to get inside the house through the back. But Cragman got the drop on me. Barrett tied me up. Did the same thing happen to you? No. It was Mickey Carr who knocked me out. He and his so-called sister, Crooks. Yeah, I knew that, too. Too bad you didn't mention it. At least I knew they weren't the real Carr brother and sister. Well, they're the ones in command of the situation now. They've got Cragman in the next room, and they're forcing him to open his safe at the point of a gun. Neither of us are armed, Sergeant. A knife isn't much use against a gun. We'll have to move fast and King will help. <laughs> yes, boy, come on. Silently, the sergeant moved toward the door of the next room, with King at his side and Turner directly behind him. Carefully, the sergeant opened the door a crack, just enough to see. There it is. Take it, Nicky. Right. What happens now? You'll join the sergeant and Barrett in the other room. And then? would be a shame to burn this house down. Perhaps we'll cut a few holes in the ice. Uh, you Hold your it. tongue and don't make a move or I'll shoot. Break the nugget open, Nick. Use that weight on the desk. We want to make sure the emerald's inside. Okay. Hurry it up, Nick. This is our chance, Turner. Nick's put his gun down. He has his back toward us. Right. So is the girl. I'll get her gun. You grab Nick. He can't get watch Greg. Right. right. Let's go. <laughs> I'll take that, Miss Carr. Let go of my wrist. Sorry. Oh. Stand still. Yeah, I've got it. Let go. I've got his gun. Keep him covered. Watch that man, King. Oh. I won't try anything. Keep him back. Now then. Oh. This is something I should have mentioned before. You're all under arrest in the name of the Queen. Oh, please. There'll be no more talk. Anything you say will be used against you. Thanks to Mr. Turner here, the tables have been turned again, and you're all going to jail. Oh, it's your dog that gets the credit, Sergeant. He's the one who set me free. He has a habit of coming through in a tight spot. <laughs> I don't know how he managed to get inside this house, and I don't know how he knew what was going on. All we can do is be grateful, Turner. Good work, King. Your case is closed. These radio dramas are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health. So long.